All right, welcome everybody. Hi, I'm uh, Tom Cito. I'm a professor of animation at USC. And uh, welcome to uh, the Birds of a Feather for the uh, Animation Educators Forum. Uh, uh, this forum was, was formed out of ASIFA Hollywood. And uh, for those who don't know, ASIFA was an organization started in the 1960s uh, by, by in, uh, in the international animation community. It was basically excused to penetrate the Cold War so uh, filmmakers from the Eastern Bloc could come here and we could all drink duty-free slivovitz and it was great. <laughs> Cold War ended, but we're still going. We're still drinking slivovitz. Um, anyway, and then if, uh, about 10 years ago, we formed the Animation Educators Forum and we just found that there's a lot of people teaching animation now. I mean, when I started in the 70s, I remember, you know, I came out of the School of Visual Arts, and I remember there was like, my choices of college at the time in 1973 was like CalArts, uh, Sheridan, and SVA, and that was it. It was like nothing, <laughs> you, know, like, you know, in terms of animation education. Now there's so much animation education all over, the, you know, n not just North America, but also all over the world. And, and, and I thought it's interesting how, you know, you know, animators get together and they share notes. And SIGGRAPH was created so people involved in computer graphics could get together and share information and knowledge and all. How come animation educators don't talk to one another? How come they don't swap, you know, you know, you know trade talk and stuff? So we thought this would be kind of fun, you know, to try this. And it's, it's a very informal thing. Uh, you know, maybe eventually we'll become great and powerful like SIGGRAPH and uh, sell tickets or something. I don't know. But, <laughs> but right now it's fun just to do it and just fun to get everybody together. So it, the format of this is not really a, um, a lecture, you know, sort of thing, but a, but a sort of a roundtable discussion. And I know all of you as educators are veteran talkers. So, <laughs> so I, have no f I have no doubt that once the conversation gets going, it'll be fine. So... Uh, I'd only ask that, that when you when you want to volunteer something or, or say something in the conversation, identify yourself in what school. Because it's always kind of fascinating to hear where everybody's from. You know, at, at previous meetings, we've had people from Australia, from Germany, from Scotland, from Brooklyn, all kinds of strange places. So <laughs> I'm originally from Brooklyn, so I can, I can make jokes like that. So. Yeah, you too? Yeah. You go, what, where? <laughs> Richard. Richard? Oh, okay, I was on the Brooklyn Corner. Oh, yeah, East Flatbush. That's what it's called. Canarsie. That's what it's called. Yeah. It's like, it's like about when you fly into LAX, when you have your wheels down, you're going over my boyhood home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Constantly. So. JFK. Was it? You mean JFK. JFK. Oh, did I say Alex? Oh, God. Here we go. Yeah. Brain damage is coming. <laughs> JFK. Not, not it's coming. Yeah, that's right. He was idle while back then, so. <laughs> that's how old it was. So. God. All right. So. We are fortunate today, today's topic we're going to be talking about is um, open source open source software. Open source software. Say that five times fast. Yes. <laughs> she said, she said, she so, she shall. Okay, we have with us um, Danny Young, just a fellow here, uh, who's on the uh, uh, central board of FASIFA and also the Digital Archives. And Danny's a 3D animator, uh, originally out of the University of Central Florida. Um, his hobbies are macrame and uh, no, no. <laughs> and I really <laughs> say that. So you know, he's worked at RNH, at Blur, at Sony Imageworks. He's currently at Fuse FX. His credits include Night at the Museum Two, uh, Hotel Transylvania Two, uh, as well as the TV shows The Flash and Supergirl. So that's Daddy. Hey, it's good. Uh, our other speaker is William Joel. And uh, do you like William or Bill? Or Bill. Bill's good. Okay. All right. Bill's good. So uh, he's a PhD in computers, uh, 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 computer and information sciences at Syracuse University. Uh, professor of science at um, at Western Connecticut State University. Director of the Graphics Research Group and the SIGGRAPH Education Committee. So, which I'm actually stepped off of last year because of the new project. Oh, great. Which good. is the uh, which I'm handing out material. It's uh, it's called the Massive Collaborative Animation Projects. Yeah, uh, we started. We started it. There. We're looking for schools. <laughs> uh, the whole idea is because we realize that there's a lot of schools out there where they have uh, they're teaching animation, but the neither the number of students, the number of faculty, or the program isn't large enough to create an animation of a certain weight 
Mm -hmm. So we're creating this program to get those schools to join at the hip. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had 15 schools sign up last year. Five have already participated. Mm -hmm. We wrapped up pre-production about two weeks ago. Uh, and now we're in, we'll be in, in production once SIGGRAPH's over. Uh, we, need, we need more students for more teams. Uh, if you're interested, talk to me. I got plenty of uh, bling there about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want to learn more about it, this afternoon, 2 o'clock in the uh, 406A, in the Educators Forum, mm -hmm. uh, we'll be giving our paper from a pedagogical point of view mm -hmm. of how to create this. But then tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock in the Cigarette Theater, we'll be having um, our BOC, which is our mm -hmm. organizational meeting, where we're really going to try to twist arms to get students, faculty, etc. If you're really interested, please join us. Uh, the goal is to always have two animation projects, two two-year projects, always ongoing, but at any time you'll have one project in the first year, the other projects in the second year. So you can always jump on to whatever project works best for your school. Bill, do you know what room it's going to be in tomorrow? Oh, the um, this afternoons at 2 o'clock, it's 2 o'clock, I think that's what it is. That's in 406A, that's the educator, part of the Educators Forum. And tomorrow morning it's in the SIGGRAPH Theater, which is right, which is part of the international area in the South Lobby. Okay, great. All right, so Bill. And then finally, we have Corbin Gossett, who's a senior production manager at Nimble Collective out of uh, Washington State University, and also your co chair for the Digital uh, uh, Production Symposium. Go. So, just to throw it open, um, I'm an old pencil pusher. Uh, when I started in animation, the most advanced technology we had was electric pencil sharpeners. Ooh, you get to turn the crank all the time. <laughs> so um, why don't you talk a little bit about, uh, uh, just and introduce us to open source and what exactly is open source? Uh, you want to start? Sure. Uh, so open source, uh, as far as I understand it, is basically just a design philosophy. It's just how should we um, uh, go about building software, should we do it openly? Should we allow everybody to access it, typically for free, not necessarily, but uh, you know, it's basically about working collectively to develop software that everybody can use or whatever. That's the gist of it. it it's basically, um, well, it's a term that's been used for more than just software. Uh, in software, open source would be uh, programs where, generally free, but you're right, it's not always free, but most often free, you can get the actual, what's called source code. That's the actual programming, whatever programming language it was written. Uh, with, and then what you can do is, if you are a programmer, or know people who are programmers, you can modify the software as much as you would like. Now, uh, the only feeling is then, if you ever release it with the modifications, you have to give acknowledgement. But what generally the open source projects, because generally different, every piece of open source is a project. Uh, Blender is a really prime example of an open source project. The, um, the idea is that as people make changes, improvements, corrections, you're supposed to, with the quotes, you're supposed to submit it to the parent organization which is overseeing the project so, and they can determine whether this is valid enough to be now integrated into a subsequent version. And by subsequent versions, they can be, you know, like dot whatever for fixes, or it can be a whole other you main can spin number. it off into your own different application. You can spin it off. In fact, there's a lot of software out there that got spun off, mm -hmm. and it's still open source. Uh, something I use, for example, is uh, LibreOffice. If you use LibreOffice, that's basically a spin off of OpenOffice, open office. which I don't know the pol politics of what happened, but for whatever reason, they decided to split. They both run in parallel, different people maintain them. And uh, it's all perfectly legal under the GNU licensing, which is, mm -hmm. remember what, was it stamp or something? Mm -hmm. GNU? Uh, is that an acronym? Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. No, but GNU, anyway, GNU is GNU. Okay. Yeah. It's it's just anyway, it just basically means that nobody yes. can, nobody can, can take what is created under that license and then steal it from everybody else. Well, the, the big thing is that you can't make a profit from it. Mm -hmm. That's that's the primary thing. You so can you can. You can sell somebody a disc with the code on it, mm -hmm. and what you what you can do is 
be re remunerated for the cost of producing um, the, the DVD disc, uh, the whatever, you know, for, for distribution, mm -hmm. but you can't make a profit off of the code. So is there, is there like a master, like, like organization that oversees this, like a Jeff Bezos, Zuckerberg, <laughs> Mr. Open Source person, or, or it's, because it all sounds like, you know, um, it, sound, it, it, it sounds like very sort of individual, but I was just, uh, there's nothing like in charge of this. Mm -hmm. I think the honorary guys are probably Linus Torvald, who created the Linux operating system, mm -hmm. and Richard Stallman, who came up with the GNU license uh, agreement. I think probably GNU, that organization. Yeah, the case licensing case. are really what drives the open source. Yeah. Yeah. But there's so no, no like. Open source.org. Excuse me? Open source.org, that's another one that has yeah, sure. all that. Yeah, there's, there's plenty of good like hubs, you know, but I don't think, you know, that's sort of the nature of it is nobody really owns it and controls it. There's, uh, it it's specifically designed to prevent that. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like about it. Yeah, what's interesting is like there's a lot of notion that, oh, open source is free and, and the code itself is supposed to be free, but the building and the support is usually not. There's the, a lot of times you find open source software out there and, and you download it and you can't do anything with it because you, mm -hmm. you don't know how to build it or it takes too much to build. and. The, so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of people that want to try to figure out how to build binary versions or DSO versions so that you don't always because a lot of people download it and they don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like Blender and Credit, for example, you can actually download Blender and Credit and they have build versions for most of the platforms. But there's a lot of software out there that doesn't, and so you wind up kind of get caught where it's like you don't know if you're not a developer or have a build environment or know where to get all the libraries. Sometimes it can be a little more difficult. And that happens often in the Linux field. Yeah, a lot of the apps that come for Linux you have to build because you have to build it for your specific platform. Yeah, true. Yeah, at DreamWorks we use Red Hat, and you know we used open source in terms of Linux because we were all built on Linux. But the fact that we actually went through Red Hat it was more of a support mechanism. So we paid for support. Mm -hmm. And the ability for them to fix bugs and that kind of stuff. In our well, one, 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 um, how many people know what Linux is? Okay. How many people know the difference between Linux and Red Hat? Yep. Well, I just have the difference. Well, the, the, the difference is that you're paying for a, a version of Red Hat Linux, and it's 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 a cut. It's an open source cut of you know what Linus is. is doing. You're not paying for the Linux. You're not. Yeah. Good point. You're not paying for the actual code. You're paying for them to maintain a version of it that has support. Um, it's it's more enterprise based, and, and I think also the front end is their code, which you're paying for. Yeah, I'm not sure what they use. Well, isn't it, isn't it their variations on or change because there's Ubuntu too, right? Like you, you yeah, there, there are different flavors of Linux, right? So, yeah. Yes. And so the the yes the ability to be able to kind of play in that space. Play and they act and they and, and in Linux they've act, they've actually uh, evolved into different camps. Right. <laughs> So, so I was curious about now in terms of teaching this. Um, I know a lot of art students. You, you know, right away it's like it's it's like you, you know I want to go out in the industry. I want to get a job, and so I know I have to I have to know Maya or I have to know <laughs> TV paint or I have to know ZBrush or something like that. And I got to learn all this stuff. So, how does the open source strategy fit into the, this type of request from students? It's a challenge. But, I mean, I think it's it's one of the things that goes against open source is that you know the industry is not at least on the application side. Definitely on the, the library and, and code side, a lot of people are embracing open source. But on the application side, it's much harder. If you look at you know LibreOffice and, and Blender and those kind of things, people still use Microsoft Office because they pay for that extra bit um, and because that's where you what you're going to use when you go to a professional job. Mm -hmm. um, so education is hard because. <laughs> Blender's free, and what's interesting is Blender's actually really big on the younger side, where you have like teenagers, mm -hmm. because it's it's simple to download. They can get it going. They can download Unreal, and they can have a quick game in no time using Blender and Unreal. Mm -hmm. But once you get into college, then they start pushing Maya because that's what the professionals are using supposedly, and so then it's hard to do that. Well, and, and it's, I had a panel on this a few years ago, and, and one of the problems with getting uh, schools to go Blender. Mm -hmm. Is that even the parents come in? You you are using Maya, right? And they don't want to pay for college that is using free software. Mm -hmm. Saying, why are we paying for this? You get the software for free. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's kind of a communication issue, and it's also it sort is. of manufactured as well. Because I just I can give you my experience. I went to school and I learned in like Maya eight or whatever it was at the time. My first job was working. My first like real industry job was working 
at Rhythm and Hues on their proprietary software, Voodoo, which doesn't exist anywhere outside of Rhythm and Hues. So, you know, what learning Maya is not necessarily as important as just learning the fundamentals of three D animation. Mm -hmm. Because after I left Rhythm and Hues, I worked for Blur, and that's primarily a 3ds Max house, and they animate an XSI. And after I left them, I went to Sony, and they work in Maya, but it's so heavily customized that it's not even something that you could get access to if you purchased Maya anyways. So, you know, there is some, some truth to it, but I, I think that overall, if you're learning, you know, it's kind of like asking what pencil should I draw in. It doesn't really matter if you know how to draw, right? So, I mean, you'll get different flavors and you'll get different results, but what are you really after, I think, is more of an important question. Yeah, but also, also, you know, you, you raise an issue about companies saying, oh, we, we want people to apply who can use Maya. Yeah. Or can you use three yeah. DS? Yeah. I mean, some yeah. some places when you apply, you know, you, you know, when you when you look up their their qualifications, they say, "What do you know?" You know, you know, and they want you to write down, "I know ZBrush, I know Mudbox, I know blah blah blah." But see, see, a lot of that is is not unique to the animation industry. Mm -hmm. And considering I'm probably the oldest on the panel here, <laughs> uh, I noticed I said panel. I didn't say the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry, Tom. I was wondering. <laughs> um, <laughs> In industry in general, there was a time way back, way back when that I can remember that when you got a job, they didn't have that on the job descriptions. Yeah. The company trained you, oh, yeah. and your first you know, months on the job, you were learning the tools the that you would use in the job. But over time, that changed. Not just in animation, industry in general, where a lot of that emphasis on what you needed to know got pushed to the to the colleges, mm -hmm. to the universities. Say you need to train up that because we need that for our people. And we don't want to do it anymore. Well, it's because that was a financial motivator. It was, Excuse finan me? It was a financial motivator that, that yeah, shifted. Yeah, strictly down. financial. Yeah. Because now, they, they don't, the company won't have to pay. For yeah. That now, now on, on the on the other side, um, in the sense of education, there's nothing wrong with learning a specific tool. But I'm of a mind that if you're an animation student, you probably should have experienced in four years two distinctly different animation systems. And you should be comfortable with it. Now, I'm sorry, we're going to have the argument, right? <laughs> well, we no, I, I totally don't agree. Yeah. I think if you're learning software, you should stick to one package, otherwise you get no, confused. No, see, yeah. I'm, I'm from a computer science. And in computer science, I always tell my students, you should not just learn a programming language, you should learn several programming languages that are of different ilk. I think the same is true for the applications. The more you are, and I don't mean learning it like every nut and bolt, but have some experience with it. Well, especially in college. Like that, yeah. that, that's the time where- That's the playground. That's the playground where you have the opportunity <coughs> to dabble and not you know, invest all of your effort. Because if you go to the higher end studios, then you get pigeonholed into being a specialist. And that specialist typically, like at DreamWorks, we had very proprietary software. Sure, we used Maya, we used, you know, Houdini and stuff like that, but you know, some of our core tools, animation and rendering, was proprietary. And so you get pigeoned in that, it doesn't matter if you know Maya or Max or whatever, and it, those didn't matter. And so what we tend to do is, is and it's back to the paintbrush or the, you know, the pencil, it's like, if you had the fundamentals down and the basics, that's what we cared about more because Determining what tool you're going to use is just reaching into your toolbox and coming out with something that you can actually use to, to draw with. <laughs> let, me, let me get this Chuck in the back. He's been uh, I'm just curious about, I mean, about, you're saying you know, that these tools that we're teaching, say, we're using Maya, um, it's common, I think, in most schools. What would be the benefit of not using Maya then? Because you're saying, well, you could do this, but why should a person now? Autodesk makes it available for free to the institutions and to the students. So it, there's no real like financial burden placed on. Can, the can I ask a question? Can a student crack open Maya and in two weeks' time be able to produce a fairly good animation? That's oh, that's <laughs> fairly good subjective. Oh, well, I, okay. no, I'm, 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 I mean, I mean, it depends I mean, on the kid. It depends yeah. on the kid. Yes, yeah. yeah. some kids I would throw that out. Absolutely. Now, and will the student not attempt to utilize 
any of the extra bells and whistles that are in Maya. In other words, only use the core elements that you need to generate an animation. No, they'll always use the extra things because they think it's new and flashy. Mm -hmm. they, they see it on the blog or they do research about it. We, we call that squirrely. Yeah. So from the <laughs> squirrel. But the idea of. <laughs> no, that's what that's we call it. From, from, it's from up, right? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Up. So, but yeah, because the idea is that they, they, um, they are overly fascinated by the shiny or the interesting or the fast because they. So it's. it's what you guys are talking about it, for me is it's not about. It's not about what software they learn. It's about what we should be teaching them is, is how to learn software. Because there is a method to the way that people pick up and learn this. Because to your point, I mean, you go to different studios, and maybe they've got a training program, maybe they don't. I know, I know RH did for some of their stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so because it's proprietary, they've you know, gone through it, right? But if you don't know how to learn software, it's a different approach. Like the way that you. The way you learn it is, is different. So <laughs> teaching them, by exposing them to multiples, you can do that, but you can also confuse them right. very quickly because they don't know, um, they don't necessarily know how they're supposed to, to approach that. The other problem with something where you're going with this goal is that, is that, is that you have these uh, all these options, or so they get options paralysis, okay? And so when if you had a program, really what they should, if they want to animate, what they should be focusing on is how to make it move. Mm -hmm. And just learning how to make it move is hard enough, let alone this concept of like, well, like I gotta rig it or I gotta do this or I can put this together. What's the effect of this? And how, what, what, oh, I just switched to component mode. Oh, God, ah, you know, I'm all freaking out because I hit the wrong button. And so um, there's something to the idea of removing options mm -hmm. so that they can focus on the core concepts and then slowly opening those options. Now the advantage with Maya or something that has a has a, a scriptable background is if you can customize, but this requires some regular sense API, uh, if you can customize the interface so that you remove, they can't you stupefy it. They can't they can't break it. So this is pipeline. So you completely remove everything so they don't have to worry about thinking about anything other than, oh, I have to save the file, click. Oh, how do I open this asset? Click. Like you remove all, so they can only focus on those one areas. Yeah, one light. Yes. one light, one camera. Yeah, it's called. It's called. That's it. That's no. my point. One of the things that we're doing at Florida State University, um, me and my colleagues, we're developing. Um, and it, if Tom were here, I think he would he would talk about this. But he's interested in developing an open source um, pipeline tool that interfaces. Okay, uh, and so we're we're. He's, and we're, we're testing it out this fall. So, so. I'd, I'd love to chat with you more about that, because I think what, what's interesting is that, that I think what I'm finding in, in some of the people that we would get out of education is that they concentrate so much on, I just want to be an animator, I just want to be a model, or I just want to be a surface or a look dev or whatever. And what they, what pipeline is always overblown and missed. Yeah. And so they come out and it's like, well, I don't know where to save files. I don't, I don't understand organization. I don't understand project organization. So, and things that become important once you're out there mm -hmm. and help making your life easier working and integrating into a studio, sometimes it's just lost. Like well, they're, they're just about the button. Tom, Tom would argue, he would, he would say the goal, the goal here is the artist shouldn't be thinking about where to save files. They shouldn't be thinking about, they should be thinking about art. And you want to remove, so you want to automate yeah. his goal, his goal, right? Yeah. His goal, um, I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit of a vandalist here, sorry. His goal would be to um, change the change the education model now, right? So that, so that the, so they can focus on art, so that it bleeds into industry. And by making it open source, industry's like, well, okay, well, you know, done. And because I, if you have to think, if, you have, if the artist spends, if you spend, um, 50% of your day trying to figure out where to save a file, okay, or what to name it. Yeah. So like, I don't know how many of you guys as educators are from industry, right, or have gone through this, we've gone through this process. I'm like walking around trying to hand off a freaking file, right, it's like, hey, where did you save that? Blah, blah, blah. If, the, if the company doesn't have pipeline in place, if they don't have even a systems, but no one ever names the files right, first time, right? Students, holy God. <laughs> <laughs> don't even come close to naming that right. So, 
But I, I would argue that that's also part of the art form. Because I understand. See, I would disagree. <laughs> that's 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 the big issue. That's you see. Yeah. That is the art. Is, the art is not organization. I mean, there is an art form to organization. Okay. But if you can remove that, if you can remove all of that, that because that's scriptable, that's programmable, that's API. If you just can go, oh, done, and it takes care of it for you, why the hell wouldn't you want that so that you can just focus on like, oh, I'm gonna sculpt something really cool. Yeah. Well, because okay, then you come some other people in. Sorry, you sorry, just, sorry. Then you come to a company that has <laughs> doesn't have the button and you're completely lost. And then right. so there so so then there so then there's my argument of because I agree with that. Um, you teach them the concept of organization. Yeah. You teach them the basis of pipeline. Yeah. You say, here is the tool that you're going to use. This is why the tool functions this way. And then here is the tool. You teach them the method behind. So when we teach modeling, do you just teach them that, oh, extrude? No, you're talking about form. You should be talking about sculpture. Yeah. Okay, how do you see form in visual space? You're talking, that's the underlying principles of what you're, of what you're talking about, right? Bill, so, you had your... Yeah, I mean, I actually found the topic for this to be odd. You know, the fact that it's an animator's education, or you can talk about open source. I think that's actually a very rarely applied topic in, in what we do, you know, and especially in an animation situation. I mean, in visual effects, and when you expand out to more technical thing, I think what you're kind of saying is right. You know, when you're teaching an animator, you're primarily teaching an artist. Mm -hmm. And so you're very happy that the industry has continued to evolve into more user-friendly tools, that you don't have to dwell as much on technology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because I think at the end of the day, people are hiring the artist, and you find it all the time. And what you're talking about is what you try to teach through any kind of software package is you're teaching process. You know, that's what you're teaching. Because that process will apply no matter what kind of software you use eventually. Uh, I actually think that the topic shift that you're already applying is, is all about coding. Because the advice we're getting from all our industry experts is that even the animators who are just say, I just want to be an animator, need to learn some basic coding because what's happening in this world now is that it's, you're starting to work in all these different mediums like virtual reality, augmented reality, et cetera, et cetera, working in game engines, et cetera. You are at a huge advantage if you have some ability yep. at coding. You're talking more like scripting. Yes, yeah. and that's the thing that I think, uh, you know, I think that's much more applicable to the discussion of where that should come in. And what you know, I, I think, I think open about. source really is also part of the discussion. Um, and let me just do addressing like, you know, like, I have been in teaching animation from the computer science side, but I also teach art students for, since 83. So I've been around for a while. And how many people here today use Soft Image for all of their animation work? Now Light Wave? Know, it's dead, but <laughs> Light Wave? Today. No, no. It's like right now. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to feel really old right now. Watching all these major, I mean, there are, other, there are other, other software out there that I can't remember the names of anymore. It's called the Senior Moment. The software over every so many years in the past, they would leapfrog each other, and it's like all of a sudden the industry would say everyone has to know Lightwave, and then five years later everyone has to know Maya. Five years later everyone has to know Soft Image, and I'm like, this is ridiculous. You're talking about learning skills as an animator. And that's the more important part. And you're talking about learning how to learn software. Mm -hmm. And that's important. Uh, and it goes, let's, let's push back to like old fashioned art, the pencil. Uh, but let's, let's talk about things like oil paints, mm -hmm. watercolors. Saying everybody has to learn Maya is like saying, as an art student, we will only let you use the premium oil paints. You cannot use what are called student brand oil paints or watercolors. You can't use them. You have to buy and only use the premium brushes, the one that cost you ten, fifteen, twenty dollars a brush or more. Who's saying? <laughs> no, no, I'm saying, saying that nobody does. It's but a, but it's tell a it, but saying you can only do Maya, and you can't use less expensive or no cost or simpler products is the same analogy. You could, you're telling the students you have to use and get comfortable with 
the premium product. Part of it. I'm sorry. You know, one of the things is, is that it, cost doesn't really factor anymore. So that 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 parallel just doesn't work. So essentially, cost is equal, um, other than for the personal purchase. But from education, cost is flat one. Um, yeah. Except and that's very, that's a recent change. That's right. Oh no, no that's but we're talking recent. So yeah. um, one of the things that uh, becomes what complexity of software do you teach? And so for an educator, I feel obliged that I'm going to have to teach my students the most complex software. Um, from the package standpoint. And again, I'm obliged to, with students that are in an undergraduate program that they're, they do want a career and they do want to be hired. Uh, I would be making a bet on their behalf that said, I'm going to use open source software that has no, no place in the industry or no, no adoption in the industry. That would be kind of falling on my shoulders and saying that's the best, best uh, vocational uh, tool for you. That's something we have to consider. On the other hand, essentially students, if you teach at the most complex level, students will gravitate to everything that's open source, everything. So that's not a curriculum issue. Open source isn't a curriculum issue. Open source is an artist issue. Artists will adopt it so fast. So we use Maya uh, as a standard. We use Nuke as a standard. If you want to talk about standards, talk about Nuke because there's one product that drives the entire industry. Um, nobody doesn't use it. Um, so there's no nostalgia moment with Duke. It's, it's done. Uh, but you'll still see students are doing 3D that'll do Cinema 4D. They'll use Cinema 4D and After Effects. They can eat that alive if they know Maya. Uh, they can't do the reverse. So if you teach a simpler, one focus tool, and then you expect them to go faster, no, they don't. You can only go fast if you teach the most complex tool. I, I disagree. Well, I mean, again, uh, I, my students would be putting their future um, in your hands. Yeah, you I'm, I'm from an India. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably like uh, most of the universities are accredited under a uh, government. But over in India, most of the institutions are private, I mean, mutual bond organizations. And we need to procure the licenses of Maya to teach. So, I mean, uh, probably half the cost of the production house. So for us, for us, it is very costly at that. So we uh, we try and blend it. And moreover, like art is essential, other than software. Like whichever the company they go over, go over there, they're trying for one month, two months to adopt. Like uh, most of our students are work with, uh, I mean, Lerman Hughes earlier, and they went to uh, DreamWorks. The, I mean, uh, art is essential. If, if they know the art of animation, if they can understand that, they can work on any software. Software is just just a tool. But it is rightly said. Like, but yeah. for others, like see, curriculum that goes very deep into the application. There's no Naming question. is one and the same in anything. There's no question about the, that it's about art. The question is, will an is, will a company hire an artist that doesn't know the tools they use? And unfortunately, and the answer is now is no. Really. And the unfortunate part is, is that that is something that is the bane of educators. Because it is, it is totally counter to it. And, and, and my opinion is educators should stand up and tell industry, go take a running leap off a short cliff. Because <laughs> what we're here to do is we're here to teach people the discipline, Absolutely. not how to be your employees. Well, and you'd be surprised how often that actually happens, uh, especially around specialization. Uh, but around tool sets, it's just a different piece. Uh, and again, where you start with complexity, I think you start, from an educational standpoint, you have to understand is that we don't have classes in dabbling. We're not, we don't have time to have classes in dabbling. We're, we, have, we have five classes each semester. Two of them are humanities and sciences. The rest are within a studio art program. You know, there are real limits at how much time you can have in the classroom. And so you have to be, you know, you have to be judicious in how you approach that. Not you, it isn't a you know it isn't a free for all. You can't have a free for all. I think Tiffany, so, you hired people for, <laughs> yeah. for years. Why don't you talk a little bit about what you so, did for what you I feel that education does have a responsibility to educate your students to be able to get a job. That is kind of your underlying cultural relevance of a university and that expectation of the parents. Yes, I agree that that's also an age in where they explore. They find their passions, they might you know, find something that they haven't been exposed to before. But there is that expectation of a degree leading to a good career. 
Um, so I think that that's always been kind of the 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 challenge between industry and academia of like how to balance those two and to feed into both of those desires. But when that student graduates, everybody knows that they're freaking out because they want to get a job, and all of a sudden they don't know if everything that they've done in the last four years will accumulate to them to get a mm -hmm. job. And if they don't have a job in six months, they're like, oh crap, I just spent a lot of my parents' money and they're gonna be pissed at me. So, you know, there's like this other obligation. I think for software packages, what you need to use, it depends on the career and the path. So for a really large studio and saying that they have to have Maya or this, that, it's a nice to have. It, you know, like we take a look at that, but really you're gonna look at the real and if the work is good, it's gonna be a different way for them to ramp up. But if you're gonna be in New York City in a bunch of commercial houses mm -hmm. where they're gonna come on for three weeks, you need to know this already. Nobody's training you. You're gonna be in the hot seat, get on the box, hammer this out. And so I think that that's the other piece that when you're educating the students in what career they're going into or where they wanna be, just geographically, like what is your industry in whatever city you wanna live in, understand the culture in that piece so that you're learning the software for you to go and get this quick win. If I'm looking at commercials, like um, artists to go and come on a short-term project, I entirely filter my database by the software that you know. Like, there's no reason if they, that studio only works in 3D Max, sorry Maya guys, if you only have Maya, I need them to be in there really fast. But if I'm gonna be working with a VFX studio and they're like, really I need this on their demo reel, well then all that software doesn't matter and I'm really looking at what my notes are about their reel. Are they more realistic? Are they more cartoony? Do they have creature work? That's kind of how I'm filtering who might be a good candidate than Maya, Soft Image, 3D Max. And so that's from the industry point of view. I do think that understanding pipeline and process and organization, while it's maybe a good thing to have as a button in the very first year that gets them to taste the nectar, the differentiation in their career and promotion will be how well they can think systemically about that larger system. And they're gonna go and hit that plateau if they can't think at scale. And I've never said at scale before in my life until I was working with Google. <laughs> but you know, everything was like, is it at scale? And I think like that's where, again, if you're gonna become a supervisor or a lead, when you can think a little bit outside of your own discipline, those are who are gonna have those opportunities. And I think working in team projects working on you know, a 30 second short where you're having to work through that pipeline is the most invaluable. I know Corbin, like in the Texas A&M program, he's participated in the past. Those first couple weeks, it's just about pipeline. Those kids have never built a pipeline before and they have to build a pipeline for that project because that, and once they go, you know, they bite the bullet, they like don't really see how it's gonna pay off at the end until they get their rendering and they're like, oh. Yeah. And so it's just kind of living through that experience and if you don't have that built into your curriculum, they're not having to learn that experience if, with all these disciplines versus you kind of segmenting it out. And so I think having a project like that, you know, from beginning to finish and working in teams and, you know, that intensity, ideally you want it to look like a good piece, but all of these other benefits come from it and then that pipeline and when they go into their senior year or how they build it, they take those lessons. And when things get hard, they're like, oh yeah, we did do automation of naming. I do think that coding in school, like I had to take C++ in my undergraduate. It was hell, I hated it. I had like three years of notes to try to understand it. Um, but on the other side, like, and I went to art school, like, but it was a requirement. Um, but on the other side of it, I really use that every day of like, whether it's me writing an Excel equation, I understand the logic. Whether it's like in my own database that I built, it's kind of you know layman's terms, but I understand how it works. And I think that that's a kind of a, even just one class, I don't know, it's like taking fundamentals well, of like English you, 101. You were saying about like with programming, um, what it does by taking a course as an art student, mm -hmm. it kicks the question, why can't I do this with this software? Yeah, you get because, frustrated, you're like, you know you can't. You stop those questions because you, you get a sense of, how software works, yeah. and instead of saying, why can't I do this, why can't I do this, you start saying, what can I do with that software, and then how can I use the what to solve my problems? Or you know, you just go and you find like an example piece of code, and you're like, okay, this actually functions like this, but I want it to be like this, and then you just problem solve, and you pick and choose, you know, your components, 
And that's what I think, I only had, like I said, I only had C++ one term, and then I went to interactive, different coding. But I, that's something that I would have never thought in my second year of university that I would be By doing By the way, pipelining place. is, in, in a global sense, is an instance of programming. Mm -hmm. It really is. And I've used, and even like going and helping Google, like, and hiring software engineers and understanding like algorithms or like, like all of a sudden having to talk about big organizations, like, oh yeah, this was 15 years ago. <laughs> oh yeah, it's just like these little things that I was like, I've heard these words before. And and again, you just are able to have very different conversations. Language is important. Yeah. And the more of a common language, the more you can get, you can move forward at a faster pace. And, and but I, I think, was just gonna ask you, just, yeah. when you were hiring people, uh, other than looking at what was on the reel and listening to what they told you, about their facility with the software, did you have a way to evaluate their facility with the software? You talked to them more about their process. So it wasn't like about what button did you press or what did you implement to you just hear. The, the reality is, it's like, say like a modeler, you really just want to get down to the typography. You don't like, yeah, ZBrush looks cool, but what's your typography? Can, can it be rigged? Um, so that fundamentally is more important or with an animator or a modeler, like talk me through your process. And that process and kind of them talking through and then the follow-up questions, that's where the depth of understanding came from. Um, not so much of, I kind of feel like if someone asks me something specific about a program, it's more like a gotcha question, like for them to feel smart than for you to demonstrate how smart you are. Um, but that's been my experience. But like I said, it's a lot different than a commercial studio. They may just kind of ask you, how do you do X, Y, Z, your process, what do you use? How did you make that look good? How long did it take you? Quick, great, come on Monday, knock this shot out. So, we've got a guy in the back. Oh, sorry. I, I think the question, I'm the only instructor in my college, everybody else, is, and most colleges are adjuncts, and you have multiple software packages, and one person does a deep dive into Houdini or, or Nuke or Blender, some of the adjunct comes in and as a mentor, how do you, how does a student who says, okay, I'm here, this mentor has never used that software before. They come in this part time or they don't use the studio, they don't, they don't use Blender. Um, Keeping it to one single piece of software does simplify the process. Everybody's expected to know as instructors to be at this certain level. So when a student gets to that level, they can be of help for them to get to half those stuff on yeah. Uh, you start introducing a lot of pieces of software, it's great for the student to get to explore, but the problem is how, how does that faculty member, oftentimes they look like fools when they when there's a problem being put out and the, student, the instructor does, like before I, I really dove, dove into um, Cinema 4D, my students were getting way ahead in Cinema 4D, I would just say, well, that looks great. I think I was like, study up and study back up. <laughs> Yeah, it's, yeah, it's funny because we, we spend all the time talking about the students having to learn, you know, or what package to learn and how to learn. And really, as the faculty, it's like you have to have some base level understanding of the applications that you're teaching to the point where you can help them get beyond just the rudimentary. And sometimes that's a huge amount of knowledge. Like to know all those, you know, and especially now that it's not just Maya, but it's Maya and ZBrush, and it's ZBrush and Mari, and then Nuke and Fusion, and like, you know, it's just. It's a huge amount of software that even as, as professionals, we don't know all those softwares. We still stick on, like I, I'm specialized in this. And so it's really hard to expect us to be able to teach you know, students that breadth of software. And so, yeah, sometimes it is easier just to, like we know Maya is the, the kind of the, the main one, and after that it's Nuke, and then you know, and once they learn that, then if they want to learn. Well, yeah, to me, again, it comes, it comes sure. back. Okay, go ahead, sorry. No, I'm just gonna say, um, I'm here, um, Representing Maya, I'm a learning content developer for Maya. But you know, it's, you know, we love, you know, we'd, we'd really like to make that easier for you to, to sort of like, you know, help your students learn would, Maya. Would Maya, like, let's, let's, would, 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 Maya would we consider, would you consider releasing a stripped down sure. version of Maya? You know what we could make? Where, where it was just the core 10% of the tools, and that was all that was in the package. Well, you could the like organization you of the interface is exactly the same as the full blown. Well, but it was a stripped down you, version. You don't need. You can do that by, by simply by. You don't have to hide the buttons. 
So you can you can create you could if you really want to say okay here's just use this shelf. You could make if you want to get specific to mine, right? You could say I only this assignment you are only allowed to use these functions. I'm going to give you an example. One of the assignments that we do to teach them, um, we don't we literally build things out of um, everything's got to be you have to take a Renaissance painting, right? Or pick a painting. You give them ten minutes. You get ten minutes to find a painting. That's it. Ten minutes to find a painting. You're going to commit to that for the next three weeks. And like, ah! And so then they pick something, and it's like, okay, you're going to build that, you're going to like that, and you're going to render that. And you're only allowed to use images and base colors. And then what happens is, is that they, they have to take a cube, right? And they basically build it out of Legos. And so then they're constructing this, op this, this space, and they're learning about three-dimensional space. And as you guys know, if you've used it, simply getting used to the idea of picking something and moving it, picking something and moving it, learning is muscle memory. And so the more that they do that, they become, you know, because it's foreign to use, most people, it's foreign to use the two-handed interface. They're so used to one-handed interface. So they begin to get this, this sense of flow and work. So you can set these kinds of things up, not just by, it's not the software that's the, the in my opinion, it's not the software that's the issue. It's how we, does, again, back to teaching them how to learn. Mm -hmm. um, learn that aspect so that they, if you sculpt the assignment in such a way that it forces them to, well, giving them a, a creative limitation, and then opening up that limitation, so okay, now you can use this, and now you can use this, well, why the hell did you not show me the duplicate special thing, command, you know, you made me literally make a cube, and make sure I move it, make sure I move it, for, like, I just made like 5,000 cubes, man, and it took me like two and a half hours, like, yeah, but you really understand how to move things in mind. And so they're like, oh, geez. So again, those kinds, so it's like setting setting up the assignment structure, teaching them how to um, get a better understanding of that space. So really, it comes down to, in my opinion, is to thinking about what you're what you're trying to teach them about the space, not about the software. The mistake is saying they need to learn these eight tools. They need to understand the function behind the tool because Blender, Softimage, um, Maya. Whatever is going to come next, they all have an extreme tool. They all have a revolve tool. They all have. They all work with these. Guys. The process behind through which we create the the, the digital sculpture. If we're going to use modern as an example. Uh, by the by the way, I agree. With, I agree with that completely because when I when I teach, I do the same thing. I say, can't use, can't use, can't yeah, use, can't use, can't use, can't use, can't use, can't use, can't use, and it, and I say, and you, and like with character animation, you got two characters. You have these restrictions on the characters, blah, 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 one set, one, that's it, one light, one camera, you know. But I because by making more restrictions at the entry level in the learning, you foster creativity to come up with solutions yeah, given the fewer assets you're allowing them to use. I agree about like fewer assets or like what you might have as your premise. But on the other side of that is that you don't want the students to kind of think that there's this checklist like I did that, I did that, oh, I did no, I that. And the reality, or for me, and going back to like a, a faculty member needing to know like every little button, I don't think that you should be the master of the software to help them figure it out. It's kind of to tell them what they need to figure out. Because there's going to be the time and the job. You're going to come against a problem that you have no idea how to solve. And it's going to be on you to go and figure it out. But you, as an educator, telling them where the goal is, what looks good, and then when you get it on the demo reel, I don't care if they have limitations <laughs> or like all these limits, if it looks good. And then when, you, when I ask you about your process, then you understand what that is. But I find that sometimes the projects, you put all these pieces in there and that still doesn't look good on the demo reel for me to make, or to be able to employ them. Well, so you know, I, that's I'm, pushing them like in the visual piece outside of just being software knowledge. Now it's getting those projects, like again, fundamental classes, yes. When it goes and gets to the senior level courses, now it's about that art direction. It's about that perfection. It's about that polish. And when we would do the summer course, we would straight up say, like, we're not going to teach you software. You have to figure it out. We're going to tell you what you need to make it look like. Have that solved in 48 hours. Like, that's messed up. And they're like, but, and the students would try to ask you how to do that, and they're like, we don't know, we don't use Maya in our pipeline. Figure, or sorry, Mari in our pipeline, go figure it out. Like, there's lida.com, look up a tutorial, be resourceful. And I think that that's the piece within school, that resourcefulness. This industry is moving so fast, 
we want them to be problem solvers and they have to Learn be okay with it. Yeah. And, and that's where like, I don't think that the faculty should have the answers and nor should they give them uh, I, agree. It's, it's, I, don't, I don't think we should have the teachers and have them do their little thing. We just have to give them the idea of how to think about it. Because they're gonna sit there at night at two o'clock in the morning looking at some forums and getting all the information. We shouldn't have to know those kind of things because in general, in, in the, I've just come from the industry, I'm just a new professor, and we've never used anything as the bell and whistle on any software package. It's always been just the holder for what the software is. It's like, oh, the my interface, what is it? These are own joints, these are own deformers, these everything that's in there. Graph editor is not even the same as the graph editor. It's just the, the, it's just the creative thinking is what the package is. It's not you know, how to use this cool thing for right. the dual, dual quaternion of like waiting or something like that. that that's not important. It's, those, aren't the, those aren't what you need to teach them. You need to teach them how to do critical thinking. It's way more important. It's the demo reel and the critical thinking that is what will get them the job. I've, been, I've done interviews for the last 15 years, and that's what I look at when I look at real, yeah. the most important thing. So one of the things that you said, one of the things you said earlier that I found interesting, and I think this is where some of the disconnect comes in, um, when we talk about should education lead industry or should industry lead education? And when you think about the, the, a classic education model, like uh, is the goal of edu is the goal of an education to to get work, to get a job? And the goal of education in academic minds, although I don't, it, it's always to broaden, is to is to gain knowledge, right? Is to enrich. Um, and what has happened, not to get all like crazy Marxist, um, but what is what is <laughs> what, 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 you, what you're dealing with? You're dealing with this, you're dealing with the system or an economic system where it it's driving that model. And so now the students who are spending it could be spending an exorbitant amount of money um, are putting themselves in debt to work in an industry that may not be able to pay or cover the cost of that debt, right? And so there's this there's this That's large across many industries, not just right. Yeah, no, no, it's not just us. Yeah, no, no, it's not just us. Uh, so there's this huge, huge pressure that comes from them on them. So they, what that does then is it it facilitates a sense of uh, of fear, all right, in the student that prevents the student because they have to get it right, and so they want to know the answer. They want to know what's the big pretty button. What is the ten recipes? How the the dreaded. What do you want to see? Well, do you always get students who want to like show me the magic button. Yeah, you know, it's like, never mind all this theory, show me the magic button. Where's the anime? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's yeah. so what's interesting. Then your parents call up and go, the reason bring this up is because this idea of, it, it's almost like a chicken and egg problem because you want them to be, you want them to be self-thinking and creative and, and exploratory, and but the education system is designed to funnel them into a thinking process that is, what is the soft? What is the software? What is this? And so that's really, well, really tricky. Well, you also have a system where you're giving them a grade at the end of the term, right? <laughs> so, like, and that's a little bit different than when you're making a creative project or a film where you're going to have a lot of failures. Yes, we wanted to ultimately make a lot of money, but there's a lot of lessons in those failures. So there's there's that's part of the yeah. philo philosophical difference too. And you also have, and I think. I guess maybe more in my generation as well, but you also have a generation of students who the right answer is the most important piece, not the path to the answer. Right. And so I don't know like what the answer of No, I don't, I don't have is. a solution to, to, the, to the problem. Um, but like I said, I now that being in the you know working here in the U.S. and now I live in Europe and I and I live in Switzerland, which is an education system all about what is your contribution to society. That's the model of it. Like you have your core classes up to about 14, mm -hmm. and at 16 you have to decide: Are you going to go and get trained as a career, like what that apprenticeship will be, or will you go to university? And we're going to make it really, really hard for you to go to university because the government's going to support. So that bar is really, really high, and it's an entirely weeding out process. But and you know, and like where these pathways cross over, and I find that that really fascinating because the education model is all around society yeah. and employability versus self-exploration. And I think like if you have an education system where, uh, what are they exploring? What are they doing? You as a university, you're most proud of your alumni for their career um, like accomplishments, right? Like that's who your poster children are, not the hobbyists. 
Okay, okay. Correct. Let's, we got to wrap what, this up. What, you had your hand up. Well, so. <laughs> this is the, 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 the thing about vocational training and lifeline learning. But the thing is to explain to parents, because we didn't live in Ireland, mm -hmm. how do we explain to parents that these live in Ireland is actually useful? Is by telling them that we're training them for their sixth job, not for their first, first job. job. Because yeah. if you just have well, a, if you get stuck in like low level positions, you'll never get any further. So that's sort of the rationale we get to it. I can uh, say that to my dean. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, every day, like the RMDs used to conduct train the training programs, train the trainers programs. Mm -hmm. And I am not that wise. But uh, anyone know like any of the uh, studios that are doing this? Because it helps a lot for a trainer in what way we need to teach the student. Actually, our quality has increased only due to our knowledge as well as I am uh, that we are attending that. So, if anyone knows uh, some of the studios doing it, please let us know. And if Sigraf can take that, that would be really great. And even after this, like, they provide things, but they don't train the trainers. They conduct it as a certification program, but if it, it should be like a uh, free interface for all the education. I'll comment from a studio point of view. I think what's hard about that is if it's in a proprietary environment, it will take you so long to just learn how to use the tool that you won't be able to take back into the classroom, right? So then it does go back to like Maya and on those individual support providers to be able to assist you in those tools. Where I think that you have the opportunity in working within your own local industry are about curriculum projects, right? So how you can kind of elevate and partner and to get those ideas to sprint back into the classroom for those tools. And I think that that's where industry can cross over um, and how those three pieces. Um, what I want to say is, Corbin, you brought up an interesting piece about open source software, finding the libraries, how to go and connect it together. Do you know of any resources for the youth academic where like that's kind of pulled together where you like these are the right puzzle pieces that if you go and you implement your students are going to get a lot more resources out of it from a software side it, it's hard because you know if you look at blender.org obviously is the, is the largest of, of the, probably this group that would affect them and they're really good about having all of that stuff available and what's interesting is that you know you talk about the students at two in the morning going off and looking at forms of all the communities out there, Blender is the most interesting from a self-help education standpoint because they're the most active. They, all the other ones kind of hoard that information. They, 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 have, they have a funded organization, a foundation behind it. They, they do, but it's not those ones that are the most um, prolific. Like it's, it's the other organizations out there that are the Blender Forms and the Stock Exchange and all of those that actually have useful information, both from a, you know, from the, t the teachers can go there as well as the students, so. Okay. Well, speaking of a cruel system that funnels people through the system, <laughs> we are at the hour, so <laughs> we have to wrap it up. But Next year we're gonna ask for two hours. Yeah, we'll ask for two, so thank you. I knew this would be here.